The following program sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. About Money, a different approach to investing you won't hear anywhere else. Your host, Mike Adams, is a registered investment advisor and works with investment portfolios exceeding over $100,000 in net worth and has a proven track record of managing long-term investments surpassing the markets in the long term. The information shared on the following program is for educational purposes only and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. And now, here's Mike. So it's Friday, and we're going to be talking about money, especially on a day to, like today when the market was down 400 points, just a little under that. Crazy times, very crazy times. We're going to get to a little bit of that, probably not very much about that. It's just one of those things. But we've got a lot to cover today, so stick with me. We've got so much to do. Uh, one thing is it wasn't that long ago that there was, on one day, the disappearance of 7 million children. One day, 7 million children disappeared. We're going to be talking about that later in the program. Don't go away. So last week, my guest was Voice Box, and that got me to thinking about it. All week long, I had read a book called The Industries of the Future by Alec Ross, and I read a book some time ago called Bold by Peter Demandis and Stephen Cutler. And I began to think about the whole thing and think about Voicebox. Voicebox was a company, if you were listening last week, that that is working in natural language understanding. Understanding language. You know, it's not the the console where you call in and if you get a directory of the company press one if you want to speak to Joe, press two if you want to speak to Sarah, press three if you want to speak to Mike, press four if you want to speak to Randy, or leave a message at the voicemail. No, this is is really something where you can call up and say, you know, is Joe there? And you'll be connected right through. There's things about that, you know, and one of the illustrations that they used last week was the word volume. Volume can be the volume on the radio as you're listening today or the TV. It can be the the dimensions of this room and how much volume you have in this room. It can be the number of stock trades that were done on the market today, and there were a lot of them done. So it's understanding the words in context. And they have a, a great technology that's been recognized well. You heard about that last week. But in terms of context, it has a lot greater application. And I was thinking about this and talking about or looking at this. In Japan, the average life expectancy for men is the is 80 and for women 87. And by 2015, it's expected or maybe even sooner, it's expected to go to 84.91. In the US, for somebody that reaches the age of 65, Every year, the life expectancy is increasing by three months, getting to be an older society. But if you look back at Japan, by 2050, not that long from now, almost 40% of the Japanese population will be 65 years or older. And they begin to reach an age where they need caretakers. Right now, if you look at Japan, there's 1.4 million caretakers. By 2015, 2050, they're going to need 4 million caretakers. So what does that have to do with voice box? It has a lot to do because there's a shortage of caretakers. Caretakers are people that generally work for low pay. They usually are working in the health field where they end up with sicknesses. And it has a high turnover. It's a very difficult field. In the U.S., we get a lot of People immigrating into the U.S. with all this talk about immigration, they tend some of those people tend to work in the caregiving. But in Japan, there's no immigration that takes place. So they're focused on what do they do by 2050. And there are about 30 companies in Japan that are working on robots. 
robots. Remember Star Wars C2, 3 CPO and R2 D2? You know, it was a movie, but it may become reality. Toyota has developed Robina. If you, if you ever watched Flintstones, Robina was the housekeeper. Robina. Hmm? Jetsons. Okay. The Jetsons, not the Flintstones. Okay. It's been a long time since I watched that. But anyway. Robina. The Toyota Robina is four foot tall. She has a hairdo. She has a white metal skirt. And she's built to be a nanny and a housekeeper for people who need that extra help. <laughs> They've also developed Humanoid, who is four foot tall. And Humanoid actually does dishes and will do entertainment. That's coming from Toyota. Honda also is working on it. Honda's work has a little robot called Asimo, which responds to voice commands. You can say, go over there. It'll go over there. You can say, clean the, the room. It will. You can shake hands with it. And that humanoid robot will help elder, elderly patients out of bed. Think about that in terms of caretakers. They need to be help people out of bed. They need to help them in the bathroom. And there's a number of companies that are working on robots which will actually brush your teeth. Think about that. That's, that's a pretty specialized kind of thing. But these are robots that will respond to voice command. It's not something you have to sit down and type in a keyboard. They respond. They can understand you when you say, please do the dishes. The dishes need to be cleaned. You know, there's dishes in the sink. They understand all that. Think about how all this has come together with sensors, with cloud computing. You have a vast computer network you can draw upon. There's, there's many other companies that are working on elder caretakers that are going to be robots. The three CPOs and the R2-D2s. Those are in Japan. You know, and Japan is the leading country for robotics. They have th of the ro that type of robot. There's like 310,000 in Japan alone. But it's not just in Japan where it's going to be an issue. It's going to be an issue in Europe where by 2050, the elderly people people over 65, the number of people will expand from 17% to over 30%. So when you think about robots, it's an area in which we're just beginning to scratch the surface. They're still mechanical. They're still very often made of metal, although now they're beginning to add <coughs> texture to the covering of the robot. So actually, you begin to feel like you have a person there that you're corresponding with. In Bold, the book Bold, <clears throat> Peter Domenis talks about the six Ds. And I think this really follows along with that. The first D he calls digitalization. Once a product, once a phys physical product is made digital, that's the first step in making a dramatic change. A disruptive change it has to be produced in a digital format. Prior to digital, you just have wiring circuits. That's what these robots would have is just wiring circuits. But with a digit, digital format, they can connect to the cloud. They can connect and be computerized. That's happening. We're seeing that now in China. We're seeing it in the U.S. We're seeing it in Germany, South Korea. Those are the companies that are leading the way in robotics. But once you begin to digitalize, then the second thing, or the second D he calls deception. It's a time in which most people don't realize what's really going on. It looks like a flat curve. It looks like things are just moving very slowly. 
it looks like it's that funny little thing from Star Wars, R2-D2, 3CPO. It's a deceptive kind of thing because you don't realize what's coming. The third D is the disruption. Is it begins to change an entire industry. It's going to change the the caretaker industry. And we're going to talk as we go along a couple other industries where it changes. You know, the estimates are that 47% of all jobs are at risk of being lost due to robotics. 47% are robotics or digital or new products. The fourth D is demonetization because it becomes something where it becomes monetarily feasible to do the robot, monetarily feasible to have a very big market. And dematerialization means that the old industries go away. We're going to come back to this because robotics is a field in which there's potential for tremendous investments to be in the right place at the right time. And it's going to leave a lot of industries behind. It's going to make life very much easier for many people. It's going to make things more livable, but it's also going to displace a number of jobs. Don't go away. We've got more to come back and talk about the implications. Be right back after this. About Money with Mike Adams will resume in a moment on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Did you know the 20-year annualized S&P return was 8.19%, while the 20-year annualized return for the average equity mutual fund investor was just 4.67%? That's a gap of 3.52%. It doesn't sound like much now, but it could mean the difference between retiring in comfort and running out of money. For some seniors, a gap that large could cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars and cut their retirement short. Don't run out of money. Call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts today, 206-903-1019, and learn more about how you can, one, create wealth for retirement, and two, protect yourself from running out of money. Adams Financial Concepts specializes in creating and maintaining wealth. Call today, 206-903-1019, or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Augusta. We're back with more about money. For details on what you hear on today's show, visit adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Now, here again is Mike Adams. So I've been talking about robotics and robots geared from the show last week, Voice Box. It really got me to thinking about this whole thing and where we're headed with it and the potential investment opportunities coming up. But if you begin to think about it, I was talking about caregivers. But when you begin to think about already what we're seeing in robotics, it's just just not on the factory floor where it's replacing the mechanical portion of of assembling something, it's in the medical field. We had Gary Moe, who developed the Da Vinci robot. It's a robot in which they do prostatectomies. I'll get that right. They they do surgeries. They've done 200,000 surgeries using this Da Vinci robotic methodology. 200,000. It's very less invasive. It's a lot safer. And it allows the surgeon to do micro movements with his hands outside the body. So he can actually do the surgery, but do it on very small cuts and seals and whatever they do with with surgeons. But it's not just that. They're developing nanorobots. Think about it. Nanorobots. One of the robots that's being developed is going to be a very, very small robot that can deliver radioactivity to cancer areas, to cancer tumors. They inject the robot into your body. You get a specific area which is radiated, and then the robot's withdrawn. Today, when we do radiation for 
for cancer. It's done from outside the body, and it not only takes a toll on the cancer tumor, it also hurts the the healthy tissue. Once you can do a nano robot, you can stick that thing in the body and deliver a charge to the the tumor itself without or with a very very minimal impact to the rest of the body. They're developing devices. Para, paraplegic people are being fitted for robotic legs and robotic arms. Think about it. Those are people that have had an existence in a wheelchair that are going to be able to get up and walk. They're going to be able to move their hands. That's coming. That's in development. And you can 3D print a prosthesis for them to use that's fitted specifically to them and one which will be computerized so that they can walk, they can talk, do whatever. People with severe hearing and severe speaking, even that is being developed robotically so that they'll be able to speak and hear. It's all being done. It's going to be make medical procedures faster, safer, and less expensive. You know, recently there was, there's been a lot of talk about the safe driverless automobile. That's coming. That's a robotic development as well. And there are now restaurants in the world that are beginning to use robots as waiters, waitresses, and janitors, and bussing the tables using robots. It's something that's, that's going to be truly pervasive. It's going to really make a very big difference. It's going to make life easier and smoother and safer, fewer automobile accidents, there's going to be fewer safety incidents, and it's going to reduce the cost of a whole lot of what we do. But it's also going to have an impact on jobs. That is the big impact. We're going to have to retrain people. But in terms of the investment world, there are going to be certain investments which are going to be very, very worthwhile in this field. It's something that this program is focused on is putting you, the investor, ahead of the curve instead of behind the curve. When you think about it, and I was reflecting on this, the first time the Dow hit 1,000, and we're not on our way back to 1,000, even though the market dropped a lot today. We're not on our way back there. But when the Dow hit 1,000 for the first time in 1966, the companies that were in the Dow, the blue chips, the blue chips, the very safest, best companies of all, were companies like Anaconda Copper, American Can, American Tobacco, Bethlehem Steel, Chrysler, General Foods, Goodyear, Johns Manville, Owen, Illinois, Swift & Company, Sears, Texas Corp, Union Carbide, U.S. Steel, Westinghouse Electric, and Woolworth. There's a number of those companies that no longer exist. You know, there was a time in which you could buy, put a stock away in a drawer and forget it and just wait for the company to continue to grow. That's no longer the case. At this point, companies are changing ever faster and it's being ahead of the curve that you want to be, not behind the curve. You want to be in the new companies that are arriving, not the blue chips that get bruised and beaten up and become the black and blue chips. It's the focus. And part of my focus in this program is to introduce you, the listener, to those companies and those areas which will put you ahead of the curve instead of behind the curve. And it's going to have an impact for people. John Kenneth Gilbreth in 1958 wrote a book called The Affluent Society in which he said we'd reach the maximum lifestyle, the maximum affluence. Think about it. He said everyone had a house. Everyone, almost everyone had a house and the house was 1,100 square feet. That was a great house. And every family had a car. It's a one car family. We had reached the maximum 
of affluence. And we were having and finding TVs. Almost every family had a black and white TV. And a few even had a color TV. And remember that TV back in the 1950s? I remember my parents had one. It was maybe five foot long and two or three feet wide. And it stood four feet high. And the screen was 24 inches diagonally. And it cost so much. It cost as much as you can buy a flat screen today. Actually, it probably costs more. It probably costs four to five hundred dollars. I don't know exactly what my parents paid, but it was probably four to five hundred dollars. And you could take out a three or four year contract to pay it off. It was worth at that time a full month's salary. You know, putting it in today's terms, that was a TV that probably today on an equivalent basis, if the average household income is $40,000, that's $3,000 a month, that would be a TV that today would sell for $3,500 or $4,000. Yeah. And it was a flat screen. It had snow. It had all those funny things that went on. Nothing close to what we have today for a cheaper price. Think of it. That one car family, that, that car we had, it had hand roll up windows. It had the wind wings windows. It had no seat belts. Um, it had either a, a straight six or if you really were good, you had a V8 engine that got almost six miles to the gallon. If you had a six, maybe you got eight or nine miles to the gallon. <laughs> it was a car that had no power steering, had no power brakes. And for some of those cars, if you wanted to make a left-hand turn, you roll down the window, stick your hand out. And if you wanted to make a right-hand turn, stick your hand straight up in the air. No air conditioning. I can remember making a trip to Arizona in the summertime. We had what was the air conditioner of the day. It was this little thing that had like straw in it. You poured water in it. And as you drove along, air would blow into it and blow cold air into the car. And it lasted for about 17 seconds. And then you were back to 100 degree weather. And you would stop every half hour, 45 minutes, fill it with water. It was one of those psychological things. You felt you might be getting cooler, but the reality is it really didn't make a difference. No air conditioning, no power steering, no power brakes. Those were the cars of the 50s. And today we have cars, even the smallest cars, tend to have power windows, tend to have air conditioning, tend to have power steering, power brakes. And we're moving into a time in which we have electric cars, which have incredible acceleration. That's where we are today. It's being ahead of the curve, not behind the curve. That's what I want you, the investor, to understand. I want to switch very quickly because we're coming to, to a commercial break. And before we get there, I want to introduce my guest, Randy McLeod from Kinetic Ideas. Welcome to the program, Randy. Thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate it. So let's start with your background. So my background has been in technology, um, dates back to early 90s, and I've worked and uh, worked alongside and started many companies, most of them in the technology industry. Um, we've done things from uh, customized software solutions to custom security solutions to, it's interesting you talk about voice box, we've, we've played all over, we've played in technology into uh, media areas. Um, today, Kinetic Ideas is put together with a team of very bright minds uh, to help people work on their largest challenges. And we can get into that a little bit more as, as we move forward this morning or this afternoon, I should say. We will. Yeah. We'll get into Thank it. Thank you so much. So how long have you been involved in this? Uh, we started this and founded the company in 2009, uh, myself and Scott Ely. And uh, we've brought on multiple people into multiple areas of expertise. Some of the places that we, we um, customize or 
spend most of our time from services perspectives are in the security area, uh, business executive strategy. We do innovation and design, customer experience, that sort of thing. Uh, one of the most fascinating areas is – go ahead. We're, Ed, we're going to hear about that most fascinating that. area right after the commercial break, so don't go away. Thank you. We're going to hear about it. More About Money coming up with Mike Adams on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to AdamsFinancialConcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Now we return to About Money. There's more information waiting for you at AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. Here again is your host, Mike Adams. So I'm here with Randy McLeod of Kinetic Ideas. I'll get it? Okay. Fantastic. Um, we just started to talk about, you said there's a fantastic area. Yeah, so some of the things that we do with Kinetic Ideas to stay out on the bleeding edge is we look at a lot of startups. We help them round out. Uh, their executive strategies, and oftentimes uh, media marketing, that sort of thing. And it really bleeds into helping us with our clients that we work with as well. Oftentimes we see trends that are coming down the road, like what you were speaking about earlier with the robots coming down in financial market. We will identify trends that are trending towards maybe security risks or maybe business opportunities or augmentation of where the businesses may go in the future. So one kind of feeds the other. And we decided a couple of years ago to start our own startup, and so we started a company called A Goodyear Wine and it allows you to find, click, and buy wine directly from your cell phone. It's an app, and we work predominantly within Washington State wineries, and it's a lot of fun. But it keeps us energized, keeps us excited, and allows us to give our best foot forward with our clients. So let's let's divert for a second and sure. talk about the good year. Yes, the good year wine, sure. The good year wine. Yep. So tell us about that. Um, so... A lot of wineries um, are trying to promote themselves, and a lot of people are trying to find that outlier wine. And so our goal was to make it really simple and really easy to do so. And so within our wine app, we have about 335 wineries here in Washington State. The wineries are profiled specifically by the winery, so you see all their wines in context of the winery, which is different than how it's typically displayed if you were to go to a store or a restaurant or that sort of thing. It allows you to purchase directly from the winery. So when you place an order, we... we um, Pre-charge the credit card, the sale goes directly to the winery, the winery then in turn accepts the order, the sale goes directly to the winery, and now you're married with them. And they ship directly to you, or you can pick it up at the winery. So it's just a real nice direct-to-consumer way of allowing people to enjoy the wines that they like and find new ones, and have the wineries have a little bit more pulse on the people that are drinking their wines. So, so And you also mentioned it when we talked before sure. about the wine club. Yes. And so we're starting a wine club. One of my biggest uh, issues personally being a wine connoisseur is having the perfect wine club. And what I always look for is the outliers, the the, the hard to find, the um, library wines, the what have you. And so we're putting together a custom wine club that people can go to, join, and get a subsidy of wines every month or bi-monthly. And uh, it looks like we'll probably do a three bottle a month for about $100 and that includes shipping. It will be um, discounted over what you'd normally buy it. But rather than just getting a great deal, we're hoping to provide great wines that normally you wouldn't find. Um, I know in the beer world, people go to Malt and Vine and they wait for that one bottle that's coming out or that one whatever. And there's tons of those in the wine industry, but most of us are too busy to drive all over Washington State tasting wines. So we're going to do it for you. And there are what? 800 885 wineries, wineries plus in, in Washington State now. Over 400 in, Calif or in uh, Oregon and over 3,500 in California. So I mean finding a wine. Correct. When when there were eight or ten, it was sure. really easy. You could hit every single one. Absolutely. Now with 800 and plus in Washington, plus the 400 in Oregon, just staying in these two states, which are making good wines, and finding that very special wine, you have to be really lucky. Correct. Have to have a referral from somebody. Yes. Or have to find somebody like yourselves. Sure. 
uh, that will send you a wine. And I know I also collect wines. And I will buy a bottle of wine to see what it's like. Sure. And most of the times I'll say I really don't feel that I want to purchase anymore. But if I really like the wine, I want to buy a case of wine and lay it down for a while and consume it over a period of years. Yes. So what you say makes a lot of sense. Oh, I appreciate that. We have a lot of fun, and, and I agree with you. There's 160 wine wineries just in Woodenville. So you could spend your time just over in Woodenville and, and not even have to go anywhere to, to get all these wines. Again, it's an overload. It's a plethora. So how do you narrow that down, and how do you find the really special ones like you talked about? And that's our, that's our goal. That would be quite a day. Yeah. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, beyond the wine, yes. let's come back to the – the kinetic ideas Thank and you. you mentioned about startups but also for companies that are beginning to feel the pressure and beginning to see things change in their industry yes and they will change in most industries how did they deal with that and well, how do you deal with that you know my favorite question sitting now with the ceo is is what keeps you up at night and usually you have to generate a very long you know, trust in order for them to give you a straight answer on that. Um, so I usually ask, what gets you up in the morning? So what motivates you? What gets you going? And, and what caused the vision and the dream of your com your company? Um, but typically, there's something that's that's gnawing at them. And if we can get that, we typically can go through and find out a very good solution or at least a strategy and how to go about that. And typically, what we find is it's a change. Um, the person that's running the company has been there for X amount of years. They've been very habitual about their, their business and the growth of the business and there's usually a blind spot that we can add some visibility to and help them identify so they can be more profitable be more stable maybe have a better insight on what's going on in their company um, we've taken companies that wanted to sell and had them turn around so that the owner had a more stable but more um, time uh, uh, at their essence rather than actually selling the company so we've seen a lot of those types of things um, we specialize in sitting down with somebody and really understanding what it is that they're needing and putting the right team in place to fulfill that. And with this whole idea of robots coming. Sure. You're spot on. I mean, it's it's a changing world, and there's tons of companies that are going to be um, having to augment and having to change and having to identify, does this make sense for us if to bring in the robots, or are they going to be replacing us? <laughs> if if we're you know the consumers um, or the company that uh, that's going to be going down that path, um, I think you're spot on. I think there's going to be a lot of change, and change is good. People look at change as being frightening, when in actuality, it's a it's a tremendous opportunity for us to to do some great things. But you also have to be ahead of the curve and not behind the curve. You can't absolutely wait for it to overtake you. Correct, and we see that a lot in security. For example, a lot of people are trying to be very proactive with their security, but they're using old technology to do so. And so that's some that's an area that a lot of very large companies are, are spending a lot of time and a lot of focus on. And we can help companies at any size really identify um, best of breed and the best strategies out there and, and help them with that. And I think, you know, the news today was about Wells Fargo and the false accounts that were created. I think there's some need, not just for security from the outside, but from the inside as well. I totally agree with you. And oftentimes people don't realize that they're either have already um, had a security issue because there's so many of the subtle subtleties of security issues. Wells Fargo probably found out way after the fact, and this had probably been going on for some time. So they'll need to look at that, I'm sure. Yeah, so, yeah absolutely. So if someone wanted to get a hold of you, how would they do that? The best way is uh, kineticideas.com, goodyearwine.com, or um, you can call us on the phone or email us at either randy.mcleod at, at kineticideas.com or 206-931-3262. I'd love to chat with anybody that would like, a, like us to sit down with them. So would you repeat those just in case somebody was not quite fast enough sure. with a pencil? It's kineticideas, K-I-N-E-T-I-C, ideas.com. And I'm Randy McLeod, which is M-C-L-E-O-D. And you can reach me at randy.mcleod at kineticideas.com. And a good phone number is 206-931-3262. Great. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for Great having me. Great thing that you're doing. And very, very important to keep companies ahead of the curve instead of behind. Fantastic. Thank you, Mike. So I wanted to return to this whole idea. I started with robotics. I started with things that are changing. There was, there was a time in which financial advisors would 
do a buy and hold strategy where they bought stock in a company, put it, you could almost put it in a drawer and hold it for a lifetime. Richard Foster out of Yale did a study when, and found that the, the average age of a company that was in the Standard & Poor's in 1920, the average age before it failed was 70 years. So if it was in the Standard & Poor's in 1920, it would be in the Standard & Poor's 500 for 70 years before it dropped off the cliff, either through an acquisition being acquired, through the business dying, or whatever might happen. You know, whether it became a Kodak, whether it became one of the others which disappeared, the Owens, Illinois, the Anaconda Copper, those companies. That was 70 years. But today, it's less than 20 years, and it's approaching 15 years. No longer is it possible to sit on a stock for years and years and years. There are some in which you can do that, but it's becoming fewer and fewer. Add to that the fact that we went through 2008, 2009, the Great Recession, and a lot of investors got hurt when things went down. Studies have shown that financial advisors sw have switched over half of financial advisors has switched from that buy and hold strategy to a, what's called a tactical strategy, trying to guess when to get out so that you don't lose money and when to get back in. We call it tactical. That what really it is, is trying to time the market, trying to be out of the market yesterday when the market's taken a plunge today to be back in the market when it turns up again. That's, that's a significant change that's gone on in my industry with financial advisors. And the question is, does it work? Has it worked? And I don't believe that it really does. I believe that there's a time of buying certain securities and holding those securities from the early stage of the company until a later stage of the company. But trying to time the market is a whole different aspect. We're not trying to time the market. We're trying to time the purchase and the sale of an individual stock. That's very, very different than trying to time when the market's going up or when it's going down. We'll come back after that. And I want to talk about those 7 million children that disappeared in one day. What happened to them? right back after the break. Stay tuned. About Money returns in a moment with Mike Adams here on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. How do you picture retirement? House on the beach, small farm in the country, traveling the world with your spouse, the one thing you don't picture is running out of money. Retirement dreams are shattered all too often by poor investment choices, sending many retirees back to work. If you think the job market is tough now, try entering it after you've retired. Don't run out of money. Start planning now. Call Mike Adams of Adams Financial Concepts today at 206-903-1019 and learn more about how you can create wealth for retirement and probably, most importantly, protect yourself from running out of money. Adams Financial Concepts specializes in creating and maintaining wealth. Call today, 206-903-1019 or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. About Money Continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So I'm back again, and I want to tell you about the day in which 7 million children disappeared. It happened in one day. One day. And they were American children. In one day, 7 million American children disappeared. So prior to 1987, it was not required to have for children to have a social security number. You didn't have to have a social security number until you began work. And prior to that time, you could just list on your tax return 
your children because you didn't have to put in a social security number. And so in tax returns in 86 and 85 and 70 and before, there were 7 million children that were listed. But on April 15th, 1987, 7 million of those supposed dependent children were never listed. They disappeared. That's the story. Once a social security number was required, 7 million children disappeared. Interesting time, huh? You know, those 7 million children never existed. They never existed. But a lot of times investments are touted that way. They're touted as this is something that is pervasive. This is something that you should do. This is something where you should be. And we have all this methodology to tell you when to buy and when to sell. Methodology which has no real relationship to what's in reality. My first professional job was at Pacific Gas and Electric and I was hired into the operations research department. And when you work for a utility or or a utility, when they begin to think about building additional facilities, if you build too soon, you end up spending a lot of money and paying the interest on the money you borrow. And it's an additional expense, which is passed on to the consumer of electricity. If you build too late, you end up with brownouts, not enough electricity to go around. So in the operations research department, their focus was on forecasting electrical power consumption for the future, planning for when you had to add facilities to generate power. And since operations research was new, prior to the operations research department taking this on, the way that the forecasts were done is you would take out the previous year's binder, you would count the number of dividers in the, in the book, and you would put in the same number of dividers in this year's book, and then you would take the information from the previous year and you'd update it and you'd forecast it forward. But with operations research, you had a big computer, huge computers, had punch cards, you'd put information in, you had tapes, you had all this information. And the idea was to see and forecast what it was going to be. And in that forecast, we began to do what was called linear regression. You know about regression because investors talk or investment advisors, financial advisors talk about correlated assets. That's part of regression. You see what depends upon what else. And the idea is if you have something going up, it'll cause the other thing to go up. Ice cream. Ice cream sales go up in the summertime. You can plot it. Temperature goes up, ice cream sales go up. Temperature goes down, ice cream sales go down. That's, that's the kind of correlation you're looking for. But this was something brand new that was being done. And I was coming from Carnegie Mellon at the time. <clears throat> Everything business school was, was quantitative oriented. We were building mathematical models and doing all those sorts of things. So it was very, very appropriate. And we were throwing into this linear regression every variable, all the data we could find. It wasn't like today where you've got huge tons of data. We had data, but it wasn't as comprehensive as today is. So we were throwing all sorts of things in to try to forecast what determines what electrical power is going to be in the future. And we found something that was correlated 97 or 98% that's almost an absolute correlation, just like temperatures in the summer and ice cream sales. We found an absolute correlation. Know what it was? It was the number of prisoners on Alcatraz. As the number of prisoners on Alcatraz increased, so did electrical power consumption in Northern California. Well, if that, that had really held true, Today, there would be no electrical power consumption in Northern California because there are no prisoners on Alcatraz. 
And what I came away with realizing from that is there has to be a causal effect. There has to be a cause for that to happen. In the investment world, you hear a lot of people talk as hemlines go up, stock market goes up. As hemlines go down, stock market goes down. If one team wins the Super Bowl, the market will go up. If the other team, the other league wins the Super Bowl, the market goes down. You hear about the, the Hindenburg Cross. You hear about all these things, all these cycles, all these variables which feed in. But there's, there's no causal relationship. There's nothing that says this is going to cause the market to go up. This is going to cause the market to go down. The very simple thing is it's, the market is driven by a couple things. First and fundamentally, it's driven by earnings. As earnings go up, it's like the temperature and ice cream. Earnings go up, stock prices tend to go up. Earnings go down, stock prices tend to go down. That's something that's been true for a long time, and I believe it's going to continue to be true because you're buying When you're buying a stock, you're buying a part ownership in a company. And you're going to pay more for something that's growing than something that's dying. It's pretty straightforward. It's not rocket science. The second thing is that the market tends to be a perception market. Bernard Baruch said it. Art Cashin, who's on CNBC, (laughs) paraphrased it by saying, when the market believes that 2 plus 2 equals 5, they'll pay 4 and 3 quarters for it all day long. And my corollary is that when the market believes that 2 plus 2 is equal to 3, what they bought at 4 and 3 quarters, they'll sell at 3 and a quarter all day long. That's the way it works. It's a perception market. So in the short term, you have a perception of what the market is going to do. But in the long term, it depends upon earnings. So if you can build a portfolio that's built around the earnings and finding the fundamentals and writing through the ups and downs of the perception, you can have very good returns. That's not trying to time the market. That's not trying to say, we're going to come out when the market goes down. We're going to go back in when the market goes up. There have been studies that show if you can do that successfully and pick out the very best days, you can make money. But the problem is trying to figure out what are the best days? There have been studies. Carla Free did it, wrote it up in Money Magazine. She repeated a study that was done by Peter Lynch and John Vanderheiden. They Vanderheiden and Lynch showed that between 1981 and 1991, if you missed just the 10 best trading days, you reduced your return to 4% from an average of 14. That was the standard in Poor's. Freed found a similar thing with later results. It's a matter of being in the market and finding the right securities and being ahead of the curve. And that's the focus of this program. With that, we're going to close it off. I wish you a very good weekend. And I will be back next Friday to talk about money. You've been listening to About Money with Mike Adams, a registered investment advisor. If you'd like more information about what you heard today or about Mike's investment philosophy and strategy, or if you want Mike to evaluate your own portfolio, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. The information shared on the preceding program was for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. Join us again next Friday afternoon at 3 for more About Money with Mike Adams here on Business Radio 1300 KKOL. The preceding program was sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. Creating and maintaining wealth has been the specialty of Adams Financial Concepts for over 20 years. Every portfolio managed by Adams Financial Concepts is customized to fit each particular client's objectives and risk tolerance. The client's interest always comes first in portfolio decisions. Call Mike Adams today at 206-903-1019 or log on to adamsfinancialconcepts.com to check out their AFC performance. They welcome your review. That's Adams Financial